You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Welcome to a special bonus episode of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Thanks for downloading this show about timberclads and ironclads. Yeah, Tracy and I just wanted to do a short episode that would expand a bit on something we touched upon in the last show, uh, episode 82, when we mentioned the Union's efforts to start building a flotilla of gunboats, which would operate on the rivers out in the Western theater of the war. And that flotilla of gunboats is sometimes referred to as the Federal's Brownwater Navy because it operated on those western rivers, rather than out on the ocean like the ships of the Blue Water Navy. Yep, and uh, so in this episode, we're going to talk just a bit about the three timberclads that were the first gunboats the Union deployed in the West, and then we'll also look at the seven city-class ironclads, which became the backbone of the Federal's Brownwater Navy. Rich and I have already talked about how both Federals and Confederates recognized early on that the war in the West might well hinge on control of the region's rivers, rivers like the Ohio, the Cumberland, the Tennessee, and of course, the Mississippi. And so each side set out to build warships specially adapted to navigate on those strategically vital inland waterways. And first out of the gate in this effort to build a brown water navy was the Union, thanks to its decided edge in organization, in resources, and in industrial capacity. The first federal gunboats to be completed were the so-called timberclads. They were the work of Commander John Rogers, a very capable U.S. naval officer, who Navy Secretary Gideon Wells sent west in May of 1861 to act as a liaison with the Army, with the intent of assisting the Army's operations by establishing an ironclad gunboat flotilla on the region's rivers. Rogers, with the assistance from a couple of other gentlemen, will meet in the next part of the show, but Rogers rather quickly started the ball rolling as far as plans for building some ironclads, but their construction would take time. So as a temporary stopgap measure, until the ironclads were completed, Rogers had three steamboats converted into warships. These were the so-called timberclads. On June 8th, Rogers sent a report to Wells indicating that he had purchased three steamboats at Cincinnati for naval service. They were the A.O. Tyler, the Lexington, and the Conestoga. With the changes that Rogers had in mind, changes that would hurriedly convert the steamships into warships, the vessels would cost the Navy about $34,000 each. But Gideon Wells had a fit that Rogers was spending the Navy's money on what the Secretary believed was an Army project. When Wells sent Rogers west, he apparently did so thinking the Navy would pay Rogers' salary, but the Army, that is the War Department, would foot the bill for everything else, such as the construction cost for any gunboats that were built. Despite Wells' short-sightedness, and fortunately for all those involved, General McClellan, who at that point in the war was then still the department commander in Cincinnati, McClellan decided to approve the bills for Rogers' timberclads. The three side-wheeler steamships were sheathed in five-inch thick oak panels. The engines and boilers were dropped into the holds to make room for the big naval guns, and to support the weight of those cannon, the decks were reinforced with timbers and beams. There were problems with the modifications that were done to convert the three civilian vessels into warships, 
which isn't surprising since no one involved had ever tried to convert river steamers of such size into men of war, but the major problems were ironed out during the remainder of the summer, the guns were loaded on board, and on August 12th the timber clads arrived at Cairo. As far as armament, the Conestoga had four 32-pounder smoothbores, and both the Lexington and the Tyler carried two 32-pounders and four 8-inch smoothbores. Although their oak armor couldn't stand up to heavy cannon fire, the new timber clads nevertheless provided invaluable service while the Federal's iron clads were under construction. The timber clads were kept busy scouting and patrolling the western waterways and supporting Army operations such as Grant's attack at Belmont. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produced the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. Unlike the timber clads, the Federal's iron clads were designed to be strongly protected to withstand fire from the heavy cannons which were mounted at the fortifications the Confederates used as their first line of defense on the western rivers. The iron clads themselves had to be armed with guns as heavy as the enemy artillery so they could take on the Confederate shore batteries, but despite the weight of their armor and armament, the ironclads had to be so shallow of draft that they could navigate in less than 10 feet of water. The man who won the contract to produce the federal ironclads was James B. Eads, a veteran riverman, a salvage expert, and a self-made millionaire who could afford to put large sums of money into the project when government funds were slow to arrive. Eads set men to work converting two paddle wheelers into armor-clad gunboats. These would be the Essex and... Eads' pride and joy, the enormous Benton. In the meantime, Eads' workers also began building the seven ironclads expressly designed to take on the Confederate river forts. Starting in August 1861, Eads' work crews laid the keels for those seven new ironclads, four of them at Carondelet near St. Louis and the others at Mound City, Illinois. The vessels were developed from plans drawn up by naval constructor Samuel Pook, and because of that, and because of their unique appearance, the ironclads were often called Pook's Turtles. According to the contract Eads had with the government, the seven ironclads were to be completed in 65 days by October 10th. To meet that deadline, Eads was a hard-driving taskmaster. His construction crews eventually swelled to include 4,000 men working at full speed, often by torchlight at night. 
Timber for the warships came from several states. Machine shops and foundries in St. Louis worked around the clock. Eads paid bonuses to urge the men onward, and by October 12th, the St. Louis was launched, just two months after work began. After the St. Louis, the other city-class ironclads would follow by mid-January 1862. The other six ships were named Cairo, Carondelet, Cincinnati, Louisville, Mound City, and Pittsburgh. The original plans of the vessels called for the ironclads to measure 175 feet in length and just over 51 feet in the beam. They were to have 512-ton displacement and a draft of just 6 feet when loaded with ordnance. The sides and rear casements sloped at a 55-degree angle, while the forward casement sloped at 45 degrees. The iron that comprised the ship's armor was 2.5 inches thick, although the side armor only extended to the rear of the aftmost gun ports, and so did not cover the stern of the vessels. Since the seven city-class ironclads were essentially identical in appearance, they were distinguished only by different colored bands painted near the tops of their tall smokestacks. Each vessel was powered by two high-compression steam engines that could propel the ironclad upstream at 5 miles per hour and downstream at about 9 miles per hour. Each was armed with 13 cannon, four heavy guns on each broadside, as well as three forward and two astern. The final products were not without flaws. Their unarmored decks and sterns were vulnerable. They were cumbersome and ungainly to maneuver. Inside, they were cramped, stifling hot, and poorly ventilated. But despite those drawbacks, Pook's turtles were, by and large, brilliantly successful and soon proved to be the backbone of the Federal's Brownwater Navy. A young sailor on one of the ironclads conceded that their appearance was ludicrous. Quote, of the mud turtle school of architecture, with just a dash of polywog treatment by way of relief, end quote. But, he added, they were thoroughly intimidating. Quote, they struck terror into every guilty soul as they floated down the river, end quote. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is Mr. Lincoln's Brownwater Navy, The Mississippi Squadron, by Gary D. Joyner. You guys know that you can find all of our book recommendations at the podcast website, but then for this episode's post, we'll also put up some images of some of the Federal's timberclads and ironclads so that you can see what they looked like. So you can find those by going to www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. Thanks for joining Rich and I for this special bonus episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. We hope y'all enjoyed it and that you'll join us again. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.